Welcome to Sedgemoor District Council Audit and Standards Committee meeting. I will now hand over to the Committee Manager, Mr Taylor. Uh, this meeting is being held under the recent Government regulations brought in to allow for remote meetings to take place and to allow for legislative decisions to be made. Hopefully those present will hear the meeting. However, in the event of a technical failure, the Chairman will adjourn the meeting and set a new time to reinstate the meeting. Please note that this meeting has been recorded and a copy of the recording will be available on the Council's YouTube channel in the next few days. All members of the committee should have their video on, but will remain muted until invited to speak. If you wish to attract the Chairman's attention, please make use of the instant messaging function. All members of the press and public will remain muted unless they have registered to speak, and the Chairman will let them know when they can make their representation. The format of the meeting will be as per the agenda published. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask each committee member and officer who is taking part in the meeting to introduce themselves and confirm that they can see and hear me before we start the official business of this committee? Uh, Councillor Will Human. I can see and I can hear clearly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nick Bayliss, have we got him yet? No, sorry. I'm okay. having to email. Um, uh, Councillor Hilary Bruce. Yes, hello, I'm Councillor for Bridgewater Fairfax and I can hear and um, see everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Ian Dyer. He doesn't appear to be a present. Councillor Mike Facey. That's better if someone speaks up. Good afternoon. Yes, I can confirm. I can hear Thank and you. see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Liz Levy. Yes, I confirm I can hear and see everybody. Councillor Rachel Lilly. Hi, I can hear you, Julie, but I can't see you. But the main thing is I can hear Can you everybody. see me now? No, you're just a hazy picture. It doesn't matter. No, I don't know. <laughs> but you can see people. and hear the rest of the meeting. Is that right, Rachel? I can hear, Lovely. but I can't see a lot of people. But I can see some. Fine. Thank you. OK. Councillor Alan Matthews. Yes, I confirm I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Lisa Matthew. I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Councillor Di Di Diogo Rodriguez. Hello, yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julian Taylor. I can see it and hear everybody. Thank you. Veronica Horman. Hello, yes, I can see and hear everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Lewis. OK, I'll go on to the officers now. David Johnson. Hi, uh, yeah, I can hear and see. Thank you. Alistair Woodland? Yes, I can hear and see. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Adam Williams? Yes, I can see and hear. Thank you. Thank you. Alison Turner? Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie Wellman? Yes, I can hear and see everything. Thank you. And Steve Taylor? Yes, Steve Taylor, Committee Manager, I can and see and hear. Joe Hutch Hutchins? Yes, I can see and hear everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll start the agenda with a, 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 agenda item number one, apologies for absence. Oh, we have no formal apologies, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll go on to the agenda item number two, minutes of the last meeting, dated the 16th of March as a correct record. Um, has, is there any comments? Uh, can I just check, Chairman, has uh, Councillor Bayliss now joined the meeting? Yes, I've just managed to get in. Sorry about the technical difficulties. OK. Can you see and hear us, Nick? I can I can hear you, but I've had to call in, so I can't see oh, anyone. That's okay. lovely. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you. So going back to the minutes of the, uh, the meeting of the 16th of March, has anyone got any comments regarding that? So can I take it that it's fine? So can I have a proposer and a seconder for this, please? I'll propose that, Julie. It's Rachel Lilly. Thank you very much. And a seconder? I can second Will Human. Thank you very much. So I can we can just agree that that's been accepted then, Steve, yeah? Unless there's any comments to the contrary, you can take it as read, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number three, urge any urgent business. 
I'm not aware of any chairman. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number four, public speaking time. Uh, no members of the public have registered to speak, Chairman. Thank you. Um, agenda item number five, declarations of interest. Is, are there any declarations of interest, members? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Uh, we'll move on then to agenda item number six, the external audit progress report. Um, and I hand over to David Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, so members will be aware that uh, as part of the external audit contract, we provide progress reports and sector updates on a regular basis to keep members informed of timelines and uh, any matters that we wish to bring their, to their attentions outside of the standard sort of audit process. So this is uh, the one for the 20th of July. Um, I'll take it as read, but there's nothing in here to cause any alarm to members. You'll see pages, my report pages um, eight and nine show the results from the interim work that was carried out earlier in the year. Um, and as you can see from the conclusions and recommendations, there was nothing there to report or nothing that caused us any issues in terms of our audit approach going forward. The audit deliverables are on page seven. Um, and this was issued before we had confirmation of the audit committee time. So that will be updated to reflect the audit committee dates as they are going forward. There is nothing else in here that I wanted to bring anybody's attention to outside of um, just, I guess, if members, I, I mean, members may be aware or they may not be, but there have been significant sort of changes to the timetable for the audit programme this year, the external audit programme this year. Um, the submission of the accounts to auditors for auditing is now um, the 31st of August is the final deadline at which these can be submitted to us. Um, and the reporting deadline has been moved back to the 30th of November. That's the date on which we provide, by which we have to provide our audit opinion and a report to those charged with governance being yourselves. So we are working with management with Alison and her team. Um, they are still working on the accounts in order to make sure they are as accurate as possible before submitting to us and they will still be well within the timeline so that we have no concerns there. Um, and we will work with them in terms of our resourcing and making sure that we deliver the audit by the reporting deadline at the end of November. The other knock on impact is in the major piece of work we do around housing benefits. Um, this was normally this was at one point still um, slated to be completed by the 30th of November. Uh, but again, given the issues with uh, financial statements, not just at Sedgemore, but across the country and in the whole local government landscape, that's been moved back to the end of January 2021. Um, the report confirms that we continue to meet. I've been having meetings with uh, Alison's team on a regular basis to keep talking through any issues that are coming out. Um, so we're, we're, we're fairly comfortable and, um, and happy with where we are in the process and that all the deliverables can be met. Uh, pages uh, 10 onwards are our usual sector updates in those areas that we think members might have an interest in in terms of um, sort of developments within the local government sphere. Um, I don't have anything else to say other than that, Chair, but I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you, David. Are there any questions, members? Okay, as there's no questions, um, all we have to do on that is to receive an update on the external activity undertaken by Grant Thornton. So we we'll then now progress on to agenda item number seven, internal audit progress report. Um, and I'll hand over to Alistair, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, this is the first of three reports that we'll be presenting today. Um, on this one, I was going to hand over to my colleague, Adam Williams, that will talk the committee through the report and then we'll both respond to any questions that you may have. So I'll hand over to Adam. Good afternoon. Um, the purpose of this outturn report is to provide members with an update on the progress since our last report back in March, as well as confirming where we are with the 2019-20 plan. Um, if you turn to page three within your reports, I do need to sort of highlight that the impact of COVID-19, it did cause um, obviously some delays in our delivery and we've adapted our approach because we know the council has been having to respond to COVID-19. Um, so we have not actively pursued responses from services in the same way we would normally. Um, I am pleased to report that all our 
audits from the 1920 plan have reached report stage, and I believe at this point there's only two that are still at draft needing to be finalised. Um, going forward, we also do need to recognise that there is a changing landscape in terms of risk following COVID-19, and the 2020-21 plan, we may need to re-evaluate some of the audits that are included, um, because the audit plan is generally based on risk, and if the risks are changing, we ought to direct our resource in those areas and provide assurance. <laughs> Okay. If I move on to page four in the report, this provides a summary of all the audits that we have finalised since the March update. And I believe in that list there's about 11 audits completed. Um, there were two where COVID-19 did have an impact, and that was housing benefits and Lifeline. The outturn report, we've summarised the audits that have received a partial assurance to draw to the attention of members, and these start on page five, which is starting with the building control partnership, which he received a partial assurance. Um, it was re it received partial because there was a number of priority two weaknesses that were identified relating to the statutory financial arrangements, including review of the charging schedule, the requirement of fees to be paid up front, and the publishing of the financial statements. If I move on to the next audit that received partial was homelessness. Um, this was a review that was completed following changes in legislation in 2017. We did have two priority two findings. One was regarding how the service um, reconciles the cash deposits made to the finance system, and we found that there was mismatching records between the two. Um, and we also felt that the homelessness strategy did not make sufficient reference to the new duty to refer that is uh, required within the legislation. The final audit that we awarded a partial assurance was Lifeline. Um, again, this was looking at the every few years, the Lifeline service is audited by the TSA, and following the last audit, they had an action plan. So we came in to in, uh, place assurance that the action plan is progressing as required. We felt that there was still some progress to be made. Um, although some actions were complete, there was still a number that required support from a support officer staff that they were hoping to recruit. And this impacted the implementation of some of those actions. Um, I believe, obviously, since COVID-19, a number of those actions have had to progress. One was relating to business continuity and to ensure that they were operating during COVID-19, that was progressed. Okay, if I move on to page 10 in the report, this provides a summary of all the audits completed in the year and the opinion that we have offered. Um, as you can see, that across the board we do have 14% um, substantial and 23% reasonable, which um, demonstrates a good level of um, assurance. We did have 20% at partial. Um, but within those areas, we will be completing follow-up audits within the next 12 months to ensure that the actions agreed with officers will be followed up and the um, recommendations will be implemented. Likewise, page 11 summarises the recommendations we have made across the authority in the last year across all our audits. Page 12 is our conclusion where we're saying at the end of the year good progress has been made with 28 audits at the final report stage um, and it summarizes the opinions that we have offered this is again detailed in uh, our appendix b on page 15 which summarizes all audits and the opinions we've offered as well as the recommendations we've made um, and as you can see um, on the final page there's the two audits that are still at draft just to highlight and we will report those once they're final at the next committee. Um, I'm open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for that. I'm sorry I, I introduced Alistair instead of yourself. I do apologise. <laughs> no questions? Oh, yes, OK, Alison, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just, just a comment, um, just to follow up from what Adam's saying. Um, we have had six partial um, assurance audit, but just to say that we do use the audit as a sort of management tool. So we do, when we do our audit plan, we do 
quite often highlight areas where we feel there needs to be aud an audit taking place because there might be some weaknesses. So, you know, by doing that, that does mean that you probably will come up with some audits that are partial. Um, but we think that's quite important, and it's it's the way the management responds to the actions that come out of that. I think, which um, we, you know, we're pretty robust in how we monitor our actions through um, Pentana and through this committee. So, I think we're always it'd be unlikely that we wouldn't get partial because that's the way managers do approach the audit plan. I just thought it'd be it's important to sort of highlight that. Yeah. Thank you. So, so members, are there any questions? Okay, so we've just got to receive the update um, on the internal audit activity undertaken by SWAP. So now I'll move on to agenda item number eight, the SWAP annual audit opinion 2019 to 2020. Uh, who's, who's presenting that? Right, thank you, Chairman. That'd be me, Alistair. Thank you, Alistair. Okay, so hopefully you've all got a copy of the opinion report in front of you. So the purpose of the opinion report is under the public sector internal auditing standards, we're required to provide an annual opinion on our view of how well governance, risk management and control has worked throughout the organisation for the year that supports the annual governance statement. So um, that's the purpose of this report. Um, just to give you a bit of background where internal audit sits, if you turn to page two in our report, it talks about the three lines of defence model. So it's just worth refreshing members on where internal audit does sit. And as it says there, uh, in terms of responsibility for control and risk, this does come down to management. They are responsible for that. Um, usually there might be some second lines of defence that monitor how well those controls are being implemented in the public sector. There isn't such a strong second line of defence because we don't normally have compliance functions operating. And where internal audit sits is in that third line of defence. So it's providing that independent assurance to you as members on how well governance risk management control is working within the organisation. So if you turn to page three, this is the important bit for you, is what opinion are we offering? So we're offering reasonable assurance. There's potentially four opinions we could offer, which is substantial, reasonable, partial, no assurance. So we're offering reasonable assurance that the way risk management control and governance is working, we're reasonably assured that the controls are effective in helping the organisation achieve its outcomes. I would just stress that this is based on the work we've undertaken throughout 1920, and it's not a snapshot in time. It is our view on what we've seen across the year. I would also point out on page four, as we mentioned there, COVID-19, obviously it did disrupt some of the delivery of our work towards the end of 1920, but by no means was it significant in undermining our ability to offer an opinion, and it's worth members being aware of that. Okay, moving on to agenda page five. So in terms of what we've delivered in year, part of our report has to kind of give an overview of our performance and what our work is based on. So this shows what the original audit plan was like with 25 reviews and how they were split down against the various categories of work that we've got. Uh, overall, we ended up delivering 30 audits, the main reason being that we do keep some days in reserve for bringing in-year follow-up reviews to make sure that any areas of partial assurance those recommendations are implemented. And again, under the auditing standards, we have to have an arrangement in place for making sure that we do follow up on areas of weakness. Um, if we turn to agenda... Uh, to our page six, this kind of highlights the significant corporate risks and partial assurance audits that we've identified throughout the year. Um, I think the good thing that this page highlights is that through our work, we haven't identified anything that we assess as a high corporate risk. So where we've identified partial assurance audits, when we've evaluated what impact this might have corporately, none of them have returned uh, impact where we think this could undermine the corporate entity in a high capacity. Moving on to page seven, that just highlights the follow-up audits that we've done throughout the year. So you can understand what follow-up audits has been added in and where we've undertaken work on some of those recommendations. Um, I would then move members on to our page 10. So in addition to the audit plan that we deliver, we obviously try and make sure that we're maximising the value that we add to you as an organisation. Um, what that value is, it can vary organisation to organisation, but this does outline the things that we're trying to do to make sure that we are over and above our audit plan adding something. So we do have fraud bulletins that we send out to all the local authorities in our partnership if there's a fraud risk that's been identified. Uh, we also have partner newsletters to update members and officers on key bits of information. 
And also what we're trying to maximize the use of moving forward is data analytics and making sure that we are using data where possible to underpin all our audits. So moving on to page 12, overall performance of um, us as a service. As I said, all audits for 1920 are at report stage, as was mentioned in the report previously. There are still two at draft, but hopefully they will be finalized shortly. Overall customer satisfaction feedback is good. So at the end of every audit, we provide a satisfaction survey to those that we've audited to provide some feedback on how well our service did. And so far we've had good feedback from those that we've audited. Final thing I would just draw your attention to, as I said, our opinion is based on the work that we have undertaken. So obviously we can't look at everything in one year. So pages 16, 17 and 18 highlight the key areas that we've covered throughout the year with the relevant opinion we gave and number of recommendations that are identified. So it's just useful being aware of that because that's what our opinion is based on that work there. So based on that, I have nothing else I need to bring your attention to on this report. I'm happy to take any comments from members. Members, has anyone got any questions for Alistair, please? <coughs> Can I ask a question, please? Ed, Julian. Hello, I'm on page uh, four of the report, and it looks like the following audits have been completed. And I'm looking particularly at homelessness, which is a very serious issue throughout the whole of the country, and indeed in, in Sedgemoor. And it says partial. And I've looked at the report, uh, definitions of partial on page 13, I just wondered whether the auditor could say whether there's been any impact on the problems there are with this, if it's only a partial uh, review, a uh, partial uh, diagnosis. What impact has this had on the actual homelessness and delivery of this service? Okay, I think that might be in the, the previous report we mentioned homelessness. Obviously, you're quite right, obviously we bring to your attention any areas of weakness or concern through our work and homelessness was given partial assurance because there were some areas we felt that um, it could be improved to make sure it achieves its its outcome. From, from our view at the moment, we haven't done any follow-up work around homelessness because this review was only completed just before we went into COVID-19. So I wouldn't be in a position to give any update at the moment. But as we have given it partial, it is one audit we will be following up in 2021. And that's where we would be providing some more information back to you on what work has been done to remedy those recommendations. And likewise, um, Sedgemoor does monitor the, their recommendations independently through Pentana, and there is usually an update report on the significant and outstanding audit recommendations. So at this point, I can't update you any further, but hopefully we will be able to um, in the next few audit committees that are due. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Are there any more questions from members, please? OK, well, we have to just note the annual report and opinion by SWAP. So I'll now move on to agenda item number nine, SWAP's external assessment report summary. Um, is that again you, Alistair, doing that one? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, it is. It is me. Um, so internal audit, we are governed by the public sector internal auditing standards. So it's a set of standards that we must follow. In these standards, it does require that we are independently assessed at least every five years. So we were last assessed in 2016, so we knew we were due a reassessment, which we arranged and had undertaken in February 2020, so just before COVID. Um, the report does highlight who undertook that assessment. So it's members from Orbis and the London partnership as well. And what this report did highlight is there are some areas for us to work and improve to make sure we do meet the standards fully. But what I would draw your attention to it, I apologise there's no page numbers on here, um, is under section four. So under section four, there's the three opinions that we can be assessed against, either does not conform, partially conforms or generally conforms. And we were assessed as generally conforms because pretty much 95% of what we do does conform with the standards, but there are some areas where we could improve on our conformance. These areas for improvement are highlighted in section five. 
Um, some of the areas, I think some of the ways that we operate as a partnership doesn't always help with our compliance to the standards. So, for example, our previous assessment on the external assessment in 2016, this was monitored in terms of making sure we action those points. It's monitored through the SWAP board, um, not the individual audit committees, but the standards do say, and as an audit committee, you are obliged to um, ensure that we do comply with the necessary standards and monitor any progress on that we need to make regarding actions to achieve that compliance so just to make sure we are fully compliant our governing body within swap will still be monitoring our actions but i will be bringing more update information to you as an audit committee on what progress we're making so section five outlines those key areas that we need to do to address improvements and the relevant standards that it links back to uh, at the bottom there is a link that would take you through to the said public sector internal auditing standards if you so wish to look at any more information as I say, I will be bringing a report back probably in 2021, the early part of 2021, that will just give you an update on whether we have or haven't actioned um, the tasks that are listed here. Uh, what I can tell you is I know that we've already started work making sure we are addressing these straight away. So um, hopefully that'll be a positive report that we report back that these have been addressed. Um, as I say, it's quite a short report, and but I'm happy to take any questions that members may have. Thank you, Alistair. Members, has anyone got any questions they would like to ask Alistair? OK, you're all being very quiet today, so <laughs> I'll assume that um, you haven't got any questions. So we just had to receive details of the recent independent assessment. So I'll now move on to agenda item number 10, the annual governments, governance statement. And that is handing over to Mrs Turner. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, the um, annual report that I bring to uh, Audit and Standards. Normally, we bring this alongside the Statement of Accounts, but as you've already heard from um, our external auditors, uh, because of the COVID-19, all of the, the deadlines in terms of the accounts um, have been moved on. Normally, this committee, you would have the Statement of Accounts, but um, we're going to save that till um, November, which I'm sure you all look forward to. Um, <laughs> But we thought we would bring the annual governance statement now as um as it's ready and it, you know it, it's important that we present it to members it's um there's a requirement that we review the the um, governance arrangements um, annually um, and the governance statement does go in the statement of accounts when we publish it um, and what we're doing with the um, annual governance statement is reviewing the effectiveness of our um the the internal controls in place within our organization so you've got a cover and report with regard to the annual statement and i've pulled out sort of the, the main changes and the main things that um, i needed to highlight but in appendix a is the full annual governance statement and i'm sure you'll be glad to know that i'm not going to go through it sort of page by page or line by line um, the majority of um, our internal controls um, haven't changed this year we haven't had any major changes at all um, clearly, within the statement, I've, I've added things um, such as the, you know, the fact that we're having the virtual meetings for decisions at the moment because of COVID-19. Um, but we've still got the same structure in place in terms of decision making and our committee structure. Um, if I draw your attention to um, page on Appendix A, um, page six. That's where we review the um, we review the effectiveness, and when we're doing that, we take into account so the annual audit opinion that um, Alistair presented um, at item seven or eight on this agenda. Um, we also take into account the um, the internal audit work that's happened during the year and the external auditors' reports. And in addition to that, we send out an annual governance <laughs> review statement to all of the senior managers on um, operational management team for them to complete to make sure that we've captured everything possible that um, we need to in terms of um, any governance issues to, to um, report to you or to, to look at or include in um, our audit plans going forward. Um, section 10 of the um, annual governance statement, which is on page 7, um, a lot of this information has already been reported as part of the SWAP report. So it talks about the fact that um, SWAP have given us an annual opinion, um, which is a reasonable assurance, which um, I'm pleased about. And a lot of that is to do with um, what we put in our inter internal audit plan, but also management's response to any issues that are highlighted and the way that we robustly monitor those actions through our Pentana system. 
and um, reporting to, to members any sort of um, actions that haven't been completed within the time scale. Um, and you'll see that I don't want to repeat everything that's already been said, but you'll see there that the, we've had um, a range of assurance levels and we've had six partial um, audits that have been detailed in the previous report. And just to say with any audits that um, where we have partial assurance, we always include a follow up audit during the next 12 months to make sure that actions have been put in place. Um, so that, that is an, another additional um, control, really, in terms of making sure that any actions from audits that have been highlighted, they should be picked up anyway through our performance management system. But if not, we have a follow-up audit anyway, so they will be, um, they will be addressed. Um, so that's what's detailed in the annual governance statement. And then finally on there, if you look at page 8 and page 9, any actions that we feel um, have been highlighted either through the internal audit reports, external audit, or that have come out through the um, returns that individual managers complete that have um, a likely to if, if impact on um, governance arrangements in any way, we detail those as separate actions within the annual governance statement. And again, they're, they're monitored through the performance system. I've got here the actions that were highlighted for 18, 19 and what progress, and you'll see that some of those are ongoing. Um, there has been some delays because obviously because of the COVID impact, but also some of them are just ongoing actions that haven't been complete yet. And then I've got some additional um, issues, projects that we've included for um, that have been highlighted during 1920 that included for the to be monitored during the, um, this financial year that we're in now. And you'll see there, you know, clearly the external recovery action plan and internal recovery action plan are are following on from COVID-19. We've we've come out of response now and we're into recovery, so that those would be key to be monitored going forward. Um, I don't wish to add anything more to this report, but I'm quite happy to take any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, members, have you got any questions for Mrs. Turner? Okay. Um, so on this one, we have to um, go to a vote on it to consider and approve the Council's Act. Um, Council Statement of Annual Governance for the financial year 2019-2020. Can I have a proposer, please? I'm willing to propose this Councillor Human. Thank you. I'll uh, second, Julie. It's Rachel Lilly. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, we just have to, as there was no comments, we take it it's, it was uh, passed, or do you have to go through and ask for the vote? I will just go through the votes, if that's okay, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Starting with Councillor Human, did you hear the four? Thank you, Councillor Bayliss. Four. Thank you. Um, so it's really just confirm you all heard the item, but you, it's a short item. Councillor Bruce. Yes, I heard the debate on four. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor mm -hmm. Dyer, not present. Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Steve. I was uh, here through the complete debate, and I'd like to go four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Levy? I heard the debate and I'm four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lilly? I'm four, Steve. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Matthews? Yes, I heard and saw everything and I'm four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Methley? I heard it all and I'm four. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes, I heard it all and I'm four. And finally, Councillor Pay. Councillor Pay? I heard it all and I'm for. Thank you. That completes the vote and it's passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to uh, agenda item number 11, the review of internal audit. And again, I believe that's Mrs. Um, Turner. Yes, it is. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, this follows on nicely from the, the um, previous reports that we've had. There is a requirement for me to review the effectiveness of the delivery of our internal audit, which is carried out through SWAP, um, and that, that's, that's a review that I have to do annually. Um, so in this report, I've just presented, if I take you down, I, unfortunately, I don't, oh, it is page number, sorry. If I go down to section um, 4. 4.3, you'll see there that we've got performance measures that we've put in place for um, for monitoring this um, 
the, the performance. And um, we've got there some previous data as well, so you can compare that. But as, as you've already heard, in terms of the levels of satisfaction, the feedback question is at 100% for, for last year. Um, the audit plan has been delivered. Apart, the, the managed audits weren't all complete, which is very unusual, but that was because of um, uh, internal uh, delays with housing benefits. Um, not to do with um, swaps performance um, and uh, you've heard that we had 30 audits taking place so that the performance is, is fine we're happy with the performance um, section 5 just talks about how we monitor our audit actions and we've, we've said that I've mentioned that several times already this afternoon that we robustly monitor them through Pentana so um, we've got a good system in place and then section six talks about the service standards. We've got service standards um, for, with, with SWAP. And again, um, we've got our expected standards and they have been delivered. Um, so no issues there. Section seven are the, the actions that um, we agreed as part of this report last year to be delivered. Um, and that included member, member training. And it also included um, bring in the um, audit and governance committee and the standards committee businesses together which were both were complete um, and section eight of the report are the actions that were recommended for 2021 and those are the first one is to continue with the training um, but also the networking opportunities with swap partners swap swap have lots of partners and there are the real advantages of our members um, attending sort of training and networking sessions not not only our internal ones that are just for Sedgemore but the the sessions that involve all of the partners because there are quite a, a lot of um, advantages in sort of talking to members from other audit committees to, to share learning and and share good practice um, so we've got that action still in for next year and then the final one there follows on from the report that was presented by Alistair. Um, SWAP have to be um, assessed every five years and there was the independent external assessment report which was on uh, an item on the previous agenda, agenda item um, and those actions as already have been said will be reported back to um, audit and standards anyway so we need to just monitor those and make sure that they're, they're being delivered. Um, but Apart from that, um, I haven't got anything to add, just to say that um, I'm happy that the the, um, the service that we're getting in terms of our internal audit is, um, is effective. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Members, so have any, has anybody got any questions for Mrs. Tirana? Okay, so on that, we just, all we needed to do was to consider the report of the, on the effectiveness of the Council's internal audit um, auditing. So I now move on, on to agenda item number 12, which is amendments to the contract standing orders. And I'll pass the meeting over to Jo Hutchings. Thank you, Chair. Um, this afternoon, I'm bringing a report to, to ask for the recommendation to approve some changes to contract standing orders. We, um, we review contract standing orders annually and over the past 10, 15 years, they've been reviewed annually with, with reflection on, on keeping them in line with current legislation. But we haven't really reviewed them in terms of their fitness for purpose. So I've carried out a strategic review this year to see what changes need to be done to bring us into the, into the digital age, if you like, because we're doing things a lot differently now to what we were doing when they were first implemented a number of years ago. So you should have a copy of the um, appendix that came with that report, which details the suggested changes that I, I think need to be made to bring contract standing orders in line with, with where we are today. So the first and perhaps one of the most important ones is a, a revision to the current thresholds. The thresholds currently stand that we have to get one quote if we're spending a thousand pounds, two quotes if it's between one and five thousand pounds, three quotes if it's between five and twenty five thousand, and then we go out to tender if it's over twenty five thousand. Now those thresholds have been in place certainly since I've been with the council, which is eleven years, and um, certainly the amount you can buy now for those thresholds is considerably less than what you could buy 10 years ago. So the suggestion is that we 
raise those thresholds. Uh, and before, before making that recommendation, I have done some research of other local authorities within the area, and I spoke with nine local authorities within Somerset and Devon, and found that our thresholds were were way below what they all were. So this is bringing them in line, not with the highest threshold, certainly, but in in line with, with some of the other district councils within within Somerset and Devon. Of course, if we change those thresholds, and that has an impact on some of the other things that we do in contract standing orders. So currently, there is a, a requirement that we advertise opportunities on our procurement threshold on procurement portal if they're between five and twenty-five thousand. Well, clearly, if we're going to raise the threshold for where we where we need to tender, then that is no longer relevant to, to that. But we do still need to make sure that we comply with current legislation. And there is a, a requirement that if you're spending more than £25,000, that opportunities are advertised on the Contracts Finder website. So my suggestion is that we raise the threshold for advertising to 25 k so that that complies with, with Contracts Finder and the requirement to advertise in that, that way. But it also means that if you're spending less than 25 k you can simply get quotes without having to advertise the opportunity. And again, that has an impact on the evaluation criteria. It currently says that, that if you're um, spending 25k, that you need to have three officers evaluating bids that come in. My suggestion would be that that is raised to the tender threshold if we go with the revised one of 50,000, so that the evaluation panel is not needed because we don't need three of us evaluating bids if it's below 50,000 once the threshold has been raised. And there's also a requirement in contract standing orders for officers to, to consult with procurement for contract awards that are under 25k. Again, if you're only getting two quotes, then as long as you're, you're able to evidence best value, the need to consult with procurement for contracts under 25k doesn't really exist anymore. So my suggestion would be that to, in line with the increase in the thresholds, that that is also increased to, to the 50k. There's also a, a slight anomaly within the contract standing orders, the way they stand at the moment. You have to consult with your portfolio holder if you're spending or if you're issuing a contract for over 50,000 but you only need to do a key decision report if you're spending 70,000. So my suggestion would be that those are both aligned and that we, we do a key decision report and consult with the portfolio holder. And we have evidence then for audit that that's happened because the portfolio holder has to sign the key decision report. So by having them both aligned, it ensures that that, that audit trail is also available. Then there is a requirement, and this is a little bit of a duplication. There's a requirement in contract standing orders currently that you have to seek executive approval if you are going to do a tender for a contract worth over 250,000. Under current legislation, if you were going to be doing a contract for over 250,000, you would you'd be required to tender in any case. So we're asking executive to make a decision on something that they actually can't make a decision on because it's a, a legal process that we have to follow. And then we also, at the end of that process, we go back to executive for approval to award the contract. My suggestion is that we, we remove the need to ask their permission to tender, but that we retain the requirement for the final award to have their approval. So no contract can be entered into over 250,000 without executive approval, but the requirement to ask their permission to actually tender in the first place is removed. There's also currently a requirement in contract standing orders for any contract over £50,000 to be signed by the monitoring officer. My suggestion would be that that is raised and that um, an assistant director can sign a contract up to OGU thresholds, which is 189,000. The reason for my suggestion is the assistant director is likely to have been involved in that tender process, and they, they would therefore understand what was the requirement of the contract, 
whereas the monitoring officer is less likely to have been involved in the earlier stages. So then to ask her to sign a, a contract for something she's had no involved in is um, probably not as, as relevant as getting the assistant director to, to sign it. We also currently have a, a tender opening procedure, which was um, again been around certainly since I've been with the authority, where we get audit to come along to tender openings. We've been doing them remotely now for the last four months, so audit will dial in and they will, will watch, it, watch my screen as I open an electronic seal on a tender. Um, this, and this was originally brought in when we had paper tenders, so they were coming in to, to check that there was no marks on the outside of tenders to um, show who submitted the tender. And there was also, they needed to make sure that paper tenders had not been tampered with before they, they went out for evaluation. Well, now because it's all electronically, they, they simply watch me click on a button to remove the, the seal. but the whole process doesn't allow me to see who those tenders sort of come in from or to tamper with them and it's fully auditable so so basically having swap attend these meetings is costing the, the authority money and taking up swaps time when I'm sure it could be spent much more valuably so um, the suggestion is that we we remove that need for swap to attend and that we also remove the need for the portfolio holder to, to attend because they've been coming along and some, some tenders might take literally two, three minutes to open and, and they don't see anything other than me clicking on an electronic button to remove the seal and see where the tenders have come from. So it's to remove the, the need for portfolio holders to come in just literally for a few minutes and also to remove the need for, for swap to attend as well but the need for democratic services and procurement to be part of that process needs to be retained. I've also thought that although contract standing orders touches on environmental impacts and social value, I've, I've revised them with a view to bringing more emphasis onto those things as they become more and more important uh, and things like the use of single use plastics become more and more important. I've just emphasised that importance in the in the opening paragraphs to contract standing orders so that they, they are addressed. A couple of just gatekeeping and, and tidying up exercises really. It, it refers to capital planning group which no longer exists. So my suggestion is that we remove the need for capital planning group to be mentioned and replace it with a, a need to consult with SLT. And the removal of the need of a tender file. Currently, it, contract standing orders say a, an officer will keep a tender file. They know how to keep um, a file that, that shows that we are resilient. So they have a supplier resilience file. So rather than having two files and duplicating again, my suggestion is that we they just have the one supplier resilience file which, which contains all the information that they need about the current contracts that they have. And that that is the um, total of the amendments that I, I propose making. If anybody has any questions, please please fire away. Thank you very much, Joe. Are are there any questions, members, for Joe? Okay, um, so we have to consider a number of proposed amendments to the Council's contract standing orders. Steve, do we have to take this to a vote? Um, obviously, we need to propose and a seconder to um, it will then be a recommendation to, to full Council. Right. Sorry, can I ask yes. a quick question? Yes, of course. Um, it was just really about where we might be able to find the wording for the environmental impact. I, I can send that over to you. So, oh. um, yeah, I, I've amended contract standing orders with the wording. So I did realise after after I said all that that you don't actually have the wording, but I can send that over. That's no problem. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Can you send it all to all the members, please, Jo? Yes, I will do. Thank you. So can, can I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Hume and I propose that we adopt all the changes on block. Thank you very much. And a seconder, please. 
I'm happy to second. It's Rachel Lilly. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So we now put that to the vote. Uh, yes, Chairman, I'll, I'll run through the councillors and take their vote <laughs> after they confirm they heard the, the debate. Councillor Human. Uh, I can confirm I heard the report and I'm in favour of the changes. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bayliss. I can confirm I heard and I am in favour. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bruce. I confirm I heard all the debate and I'm in favour. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Facey. Councillor Facey. <coughs> I'll come back to Councillor Facey. Yes, I can confirm I was here without the debate, through the debate, and I'm quite happy to accept it, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Levy. I can confirm that I've heard the report and I'm in favour. Thank you. Councillor Lilly. Councillor Lilly. I'll come back to Councillor Lilly. Councillor Matthews. Yes, I confirm I uh, heard the debate and I've read the report and I'm in favour. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Methley. I've heard the, the debate and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rodriguez. Yes, I've heard the debate and I'm for. Thank you. Councillor Pay. Yeah, I heard the debate and I'm for. Right, I'll just check. I think uh, Councillor Lilly may have left the meeting. I'm back, Steve. Sorry, the server threw me out. Okay. Um, I heard the debate and I'm for. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that's clearly carried, Chairman. Unanimous. Thank you, Councillors. Now we move on to agenda item number 13, the Councillors' allowances for 2019 to 2020. Um, is Mr Melhewish presenting this? Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, Members. And uh, this is the annual report. It's a requirement of the Council's constitution for the allowances that have been paid in the previous year to be reported into audit and standards um, as a statement of, uh, of, of fact. Um, obviously, you will note there are some other named members on there for some of the new new members on committee those were councillors who uh, didn't get re-elected or didn't stand at uh, the elections last May so this will be uh, a, a regular feature at this time every year to uh, the audit uh, and standards committee and it's there for your uh, information and and uh, to note but I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any thank you Mr Matthew are there any questions councillors Okay, as there's no questions, all we have to do on this is to note the allowances and expenses paid to councillors during the year 2020, sorry, 2019 to 2020 financial year. Thank you, Mr. Mal. You wish now we'll move on to the last agenda item, number 14, councillors' attendance for 2019 to 2020. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, this is a, a similar requirement again in the Constitution that uh, members' attendances from uh, council meetings and uh, committees that members serve on is reported and uh, as you obviously are aware when you have been coming into the meetings in Bridgewater House we get you to sign in to uh, say that you've come to the meeting and then that information is collated onto a spreadsheet to present the uh, the, the returns there for all members um, and they become a, a matter of uh, public record um, and will be done again um, each year. Obviously now we're doing things remotely, we are taking a different way of recording them but we are still recording all of the attendances so uh, rest assured next year at this time when this report comes back it will still contain all of the appropriate um, information but again it's uh, a report there for you to note but I'm quite happy to answer any questions that anybody may have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You wish, um, councillors have, has, or members, have you any um, questions for on this report? Julie, just a quick question. It's Rachel. Oh, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sorry, I didn't know if you could hear. What happens, like, with certain levels? Like, is it fifty percent when there's a review into attendance? If there was going to be, if there was going to be a review into attendance, the figures there would be very low, and we would be looking um, for any members who haven't attended a meeting for a 
period of six months. That's a consecutive period of six months. So we will monitor the figures and obviously if nobody is uh, coming to the meetings, we would then speak to the appropriate group leader and just flag up and say councillor so-and-so's attendance levels are low and obviously then there may be something to, to, to be reviewed within in the groups. Um, but obviously at the moment, um, we're, we're, we're uh, everybody's, although some attendance levels are, are lowish on that report, people have been attending um, and that no action of, of that nature is necessary at this current time. Okay, thanks, Andrew. It's just, I think, people that make a real effort, and I know I can't attend every meeting, but I do my best to. It's just, it's not fair on everybody that does make a real effort when there's a few that seem to be quite low. But thank you. Councillor Hilary Bruce, you, ha you have a question? Yes, thank you. It was just that my name's down as being against audit and standards and community scrutiny, but I'm on corporate scrutiny, not community. Apologies for All that right. uh, typographical noted. Not thank sure you. If it changes the data, but whatever. <laughs> no, the data the data will be the same. That's me when I was typing the the committees you were on in. I think it's much getting confused between the two but now I can confirm the data is um, taken from the spreadsheet and that will be correct for your attendances. Okay, thank you. Councillor Rodriguez, you have a question? Yeah, thank you Chair. Um, just on my one, um, it says I had a certain to, but I didn't sit in any committee. So I wanted meetings there's eight assuming that we only sat both of us only sat for council i wondered why i would have nine meetings to attend and the chair would have eight uh that may be um a typographical error then i would i'm just going to look at the spreadsheet just sorry bear with me a second the system is uh, a little bit slow let me just take Yeah, I think that's just a typographical um, um, error. I'll I'll pull up the spreadsheet and uh, just just check that one for for definite. Uh, but yes, it should be four and eight. I think the percentage is probably right, but the nine is wrong. So yes, sorry about that. Thank you. Are there any more questions, uh, members? Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Malkiewicz, for those two reports. Um, as there's no further questions. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending this meeting and bring it to an, a close. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Cheerio, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. You.